Good afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody can hear me okay. This is Colin Asson, just by name showing on the side is Kelly Sherman. I'm a staff member at the Ontario Invasive Plant Council coming to you from Peterborough this afternoon. Um, and I guess while we wait for the last couple folks to sign in quickly, um, I'll go ahead and give a little bit of context here. So the OIPC is very excited that uh, we're going through a bit of a banner year this year. This is our 10th anniversary, and for those of you who have been um, aware of and supporting and active in the organization for a while, hello and thank you. And for those of you who are new to this, uh, hello and welcome. So uh, I was trying to prepare some numbers here because I thought it's interesting given an opportunity to look back at some context here. And this actually marks our 2017-2018. That's our fifth webinar, a uh, winter webinar series. And it's an accomplishment that we're quite proud about. And so I was kind of scrolling through, you know, some of the history of the webinar program. I've been involved within it for three years now, and just kind of scrolling back. Um, and it's funny some of the things you dig up and have a look at. And and some of the information has certainly changed, but a lot of it's absolutely still important and relevant. So I just wanted to kind of uh, my cap a little bit back to the folks who have volunteered to lead our webinars in the past and uh, staff members at the organization as well. And just make a quick little self-promoting uh, plug here that if your organizations may be considering, you know, what are we going to do for um, staff training, say, for the upcoming season, um, these are really good resources. And the last three years' worth of uh, winter webinar series, they've all been recorded and they're posted on our website. So if you'd like to sit down a couple summer staff members for a couple hours to really bring them up to speed on invasive plants, and that's you know species-specific control techniques, or it could be different resources that exist like our clean equipment protocol and all kinds of other great topics. Um, we've got those webinars available. Those are available on our website. The versions of the webinars are still available on our website as well. And on the same page that you found, um, clearly registered today. So it's ontarioinvasiveplants.ca slash webinars. Feel free to check those out. On that note, looking forward, um, in my opinion, I think we've got a pretty exciting uh, season of webinars coming up. Now you can see them. So to quickly plug some of the upcoming webinars we've got scheduled, this is our first one in the series, so I want to take the opportunity to plug some of the folks who are coming up um, immediately after the holidays there. So if you were at our AGM, you would have seen Rob Boucher speak. He's going to be presenting a similar talk on our uh, upcoming webinar on January 10th. That's another, all these are uh, Wednesdays during the lunch hour from 12 to 1. And Rob's going to give us kind of a one-hour version of everything interesting that's happening in biological control relevant to Ontario plants. So what's happening with uh, the high penna release and dog strangling vine? What's happening with Japanese knotweed biocontrol programs? Um, what's happening with frag biocontrol? Many of these are not at the implementation phase yet, but Rob's going to give us a bit of a primer and update on where any of these programs are. On 24th of January, we've got Kyle Borrowman, Amanda Cooper, and Robert McGowan. And they're going to co-present a webinar on kind of three very different aquatic invasive plant species. They're going to present to us on uh, European water chestnut, Eurasian water milfoil, and water soldier. And those are all three different, very different beasts that are controlled using very different technique. One hand pulling, one chemical control, and one biocontrol. So it's really going to be an interesting talk to give us a span the gamut on the different management techniques. We've also got an update on the uh, emergency use frag mites control project that's happening in Long Point. Eric Cleland from the Nature Conservancy is kind enough to join us on February 7th. Okay. February 21st, we've got fighting invasive plants, uh, kind of a catch-all talk, um, what's happening in different municipalities across the province um, with respect to managing invasive plants through a unified framework. On March 7th, we've got a really neat historical perspective on biocontrol of purple loosestrife across Ontario with some updates on what's happening now, why the plant seems to have spiked over the last couple years relative to years previous. That's presented by Donna McKenzie of Ontario Beetles. And last but not least, uh, on March 21st, we have a really neat talk 
from Michael McTavish, a PhD candidate at University of Waterloo, talking about the impacts of exotic earthworms, what their relevance is to plant invasion and reseeding and restoration. So a really neat uh, lineup this year. We're quite excited to present it for you this year. But without further ado, I wanted to jump into the first webinar series, which is this webinar that we're here to focus in on today. And it's presented by me, Colin Cass, and staff at the Ontario Invasive Plant Council. I start off by trying to summarize, you know, the hundred hundred coolest things that we could all be each other essentially as nonprofits working on or, or even governmental organizations. Uh, sorry, I just got a message there saying audio is not working. Um, if anybody else is hearing me, and I hope you are at this point, if you can just leave me a quick note in the chat box just saying hear you loud and clear. A couple. Oh, thanks, Stephanie. Okay, so I'm going to proceed. Um, if you have any issue, maybe consider it. Thanks, John. Um, so if you want to consider just logging out and uh, re-logging in, we'd appreciate it. It tends to reset when you do that. So give that a shot if you could. Um, so we don't. We only have an hour, so I guess we can't cover the hundred coolest programs and projects and kind of individual style of events that we could maybe take from each other and, and reinvigorate. Um, but trying to, what I'm trying to do is get across the top five or six really interesting, unique spins on invasive plant-related kind of stewardship activities happening across the province. And the plant council is involved in a couple projects, but we have a really unique vantage point here to see and support and chime in on a bunch of really interesting projects that are happening across Ontario right now related to invasive species stewardship and kind of community engagement. And with that in mind, I wanted to present this webinar based on some of the feedback we've got asking for basically, you know, can we not reinvent the wheel? What great ideas are we generating creative approaches to engaging people and engaging volunteers? And how can we kind of model those? So what I'm hoping you're, everyone's going to get out of this today is just to kind of see and, and experience some of the pros and cons of different approaches that different groups have taken related to engaging volunteers and communities in invasive plant stewardship and control. And kind of understand where we all fit into the, the bigger picture a little bit more. So with that in mind, I've stolen the terrible analogy that is um, a puzzle. And you know, I think we tend to silo up a little bit at times across the province. And so this is my kind of personal take on where do we all fit into this big picture here. And this is not necessarily comprehensive, but this hopefully gives us all an idea of where we fit into this bigger machine, big picture. So we've got federal agencies such as CFIA, but not exclusively limited to them. And they're mainly, their role in this conversation is primarily about preventing new species coming into Ontario that we don't want, things that we've heard from our neighbors, like hydrillas of the world, uh, that, that we're aware of that we really don't want. We've learned the lessons from our neighbors to the south or from other countries as well. And also regulate movement of species within Canada to some degree as well. And we have on a provincial level ministries like MNRF and others, and, and primarily what they're bringing to the table here in addition to other things, but, but primarily is enabling a legislative framework here so that we can kind of um, more comprehensively address this on a provincial scale. And so on that kind of big scale beyond the local level, uh, we have some nonprofits supporting the cause as well. So Ontario Invasive Plant Council, uh, we have the Invasive Species Centre based in Sault Ste. Marie, and we have the Federation of Anglers and Hunters Invading Species Awareness Program based in Peterborough as well. And primarily where they fit into this equation is, is really focused on driving education and outreach and awareness. Um, being a hub for um, invasive plant uh, resources and kind of knowledge exchange in the case of the Plant Council, and connecting experts and maintaining these professional networks. But on a local level, this is where the change tends to happen, and this is ultimately where we're focusing on today. Are the conservation authorities um, and upper tier and lower tier municipalities, because ultimately combined, these are the biggest landowners across the province. And most of these species that become established, the buckthorns, the garlic mustards, and even the dog stringling vines of the world, well, they tend to fall down the, the, the kind of chain to the localized landowner. And municipalities, upper tier, lower tier, tend to be the biggest groups associated with that. And then fitting into this big picture puzzle, broader uh, picture here, is we've got other kind of more localized grassroots organizations. So was putting this webinar together, I'm sorry, I just saw your note there. Maybe if you could try and log out and re-log back in, uh, just see if we can kick that audio going again. 
Um, but what these organizations kind of fit into this bigger picture is that ultimately it comes down to us to prevent or I guess the spread of these locally established species and hopefully kind of turn back the, the, the hands of time on this. So understanding here that it's unreasonable to expect us all to have staff to be able to go out and deal with these things, pulling thirds of the world, pulling garlic mustards, um, even mapping out dog strangling and vine and pulling this out of the equation. Although we need to figure out collectively how can we best use volunteer networks and our kind of existing locally engaged stakeholders. Um, in turning back these things. And this idea, there's lots of exciting things that I'm going to talk about and kind of case studies I'm going to feature in a little bit, but ultimately these aren't going to happen without resources. So I was asked to throw this slide in or um, cut a, a list of the usual suspects for where do we go to fund invasive species stewardship. And I think that there's a pretty mixed background based on my understanding of everybody who's on this webinar today. Of, of who's applying to these and I guess um, what your experience level is. But if you're kind of new to this, if you're putting on the perspective that uh, my organization doesn't have an invasive species or an invasive plant control program underway or volunteer engagement, I just wanted to make sure that you have access and understanding that, that these tend to be really good resources. So in a very quick way, and again, my organization obviously does not give out these grants, um, but I just wanted to kind of um, pass along some kind of tips and, and uh, context, I guess, for where these all tend to fit in. Now, you can Google each of these individually and find out the actual specifics on when these deadlines are and what fits exactly and what doesn't fit, so please don't hold me accountable to that. But I wanted to just kind of give you, if this is your first um, jump into the conversation, I wanted to give you a little bit of context of where these all fit in. On a provincial scope, we have MNRF Species at Risk Stewardship Fund. It's an annual program. The deadlines tend to be around fall, um, so look for the next deadline somewhere in fall 2018. As best I know, they haven't released a date to this yet. In different categories, your program or your kind of potential program have in your mind that can fit into. Um, kind of two major ones that we hear from both these case studies I'm presenting and other folks on the ground across the province. They're seeing their programs fit into uh, one of the categories habitat management and restoration. And so you can go about um, uh, dealing with costs associated with restoration activities. That could be a contractor that's coming in to do work that maybe your organization is able, you don't have a, a herbicide applicator on staff, for instance, to control some larger buckthorn plants. Uh, that could be the, the type of activity or the type of, of application of that grant. You can use that grant towards equipment as well and quite a, a wide suite of other activities as well. The second category I just wanted to mention quickly was their survey, inventory, and monitoring category. And so you could use that to the extent of, of preparing fact sheets, publications, related resources, that kind of a thing. So the Set Risk Stewardship Fund, uh, a widely used tool. Uh, we also have the Habitat Stewardship Program um, tool as well. And so that's another nice one. It's got a Species at Risk uh, Stewardship uh, focus to it as well. But also, we all know that uh, species at risk and invasive plants and invasive species kind of tend to go hand in hand here. We're dealing with two different sides of ultimately the same issue in many cases. Um, that's an annual program as well, also about the same timeline in the fall 2018 is when we're expecting the next round to, to be made. Um, third there, on a more kind of smaller scale, uh, the TD Friends of the Environment Foundation tend to be very big supporters of invasive plant stewardship across the province as well. I'm sure many uh, folks on the call have, have applied to and hopefully successfully received funding for that. Um, we tend to fit in big picture is uh, hands-on volunteer stewardship, kind of tree plantings, maybe you've already done a removal. Sometimes they'll help out with removal costs as well, maybe purchasing some equipment like an extractigator for a buckthorn removal, um, helping to support some native tree restoration, that kind of a thing to a project that's already been done. So they can be a really helpful tool. Uh, they have no official funding cap, but as I understand it, the majority of their projects that they fund tend to fall between $2,000 and $8,000. So um, to some degree, you can rely on salary dollars to that, but again, it's mainly about kind of enabling hands-on volunteer activities with that, that grant stream. TD Friends of the Environment. Um, there's also BEAN, the Biodiversity Education and Awareness Network in Ontario. It's a little bit of a smaller um, chunk of, of money that we can apply to as well. Uh, there's a $500 cap, but it tends to be really helpful in enabling kind of if we have an existing maybe staff or volunteer group um, who's really engaged in a particular habit or a particular site, 
this can be a great tool um, to help enable them or your organization to do some work. That kind of tends um, to be very community focused, very stewardship focused again. Um, so if you need some plant material for restoration, maybe some materials for event promotion, that sort of a thing, that might be a really good resource to consider. And the last thing I wanted to pitch because I tend um, I, from what I hear across Ontario is that they tend to be underutilized for the purpose of invasive plant stewardship, or that local municipalities, uh, both upper tier and lower tier, tending to put their either biodiversity or sustainability grants, they tend to be very small but community-oriented, community-focused. I think as a broader group of, of, of practitioners, we can rely on that a little bit stronger. Just for some kind of community examples, if you're interested in looking up what does that look like in a community near me, Ajax, Halton Hills, even Peterborough have small pots of money. They tend to be $1,000, $2,000, something in that neighborhood. But again, those tend to be very people-oriented, very stewardship-oriented. And I think as a broader group, we could definitely rely on those a little bit more. So hopefully you found the money. And now it's time to think about resources. What exists? What do I need to um, create and tailor towards my program? Well, our main goal at the OIPC is really not about reinventing the wheel. We put a lot of effort into developing resources that are absolutely applicable to this kind of a conversation. And so uh, I just wanted to take a bit of a second to plug those quickly. So in terms of species-specific resources, I have purple loosestrife, I have Phragmites or Japanese knotweed, and I want to know how to manage that. We've got two good resources I wanted to plug. Our BMP, our Best Management Practices series, um, it's been around for quite a while. We're um, getting up there now. We have 16 of the usual suspect species developed. So those are species like Phragmites, Dog Strangling Vine. These are all available free on our website. Some of them are in print. Many of them are out of print, unfortunately. But the updated PDFs are all available for free on our website. So if you go to ontarioinvasiveplants.ca slash BMP, short for Best Management Practices, they're all available there. On the same URL, uh, in 2017, you, you can also find a, a series that was developed and called their Technical Bulletin Series. And basically, that was created. They're kind of one or two or three page fact sheets. They're all species specific. And they beat around the bush. They have the specific information for control that people are asking for. What herbicides used on species X, Y, or Z at what application rate, for instance? Or what is the most effective way to deal with a small patch of garlic mustard that's only the size of two or three picnic tables? They're all species specific. I have them in a line there on the right, uh, the second line of resources up from the bottom on this page you're currently viewing. So I encourage everybody to check them out. They're at that same website, ontarioinvasiveplants.ca slash BMP. And the last thing I wanted to plug are the quick reference guide to invasive plants. Um, you know, we all have our Newcombs guide or our ROM field guides for Ontario wildflowers, and they're wonderful resources, but obviously they don't focus on invasive plants. But if we want our kind of stewardship attendees and our volunteers to know what they're looking at and become a little more familiar so that when they're walking their dog on that part of the trail, that we maybe don't have the staff capacity to go out and survey, and they see a new patch of honeysuckle we didn't know about, they can become familiar with. It's a good little flipper guide, very user-friendly, lots of nice photos. And that's available for free on our website. When we have it in stock, we're very happy to ship them out for free as well. Um, so those are the resources that exist. We're happy to have people take them, modify the print files to adapt them a little bit more to your organization if you're willing to print them on your own and we don't have them in stock. So please feel free to track us down and, and uh, you know use them widely and please share them widely. We give them for, for wide use. So. With in mind, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the tools that people are actually out there using, some of the case studies. It's pretty wide open here. What I was hoping to do is just kind of, like I say before, pull some of the neatest ideas that I think that people are using and the tools people are using to engage people across Ontario in the of plant um, volunteer activities and control uh, activities as well. I'm going to start with a program that the OIPC and the Invasive Species Center and the Invading Species Awareness Program, ISAP, have all collaborated together on. I've been running this program for a few years now. We're now into our third year. It's supported by Ontario Trillium Foundation. And I just want to pitch a few of the kind of um, unique events that we've tried to run to engage people um, in communities across Ontario. So we, start, we first started, uh, I guess, about three years ago working in Thunder Bay, Sault Ste. Marie, Alton region. And more recently, we've kind of swift, uh, shifted our focus here to central Ontario, um, and we're defining that more or less as kind of 
the Sudbury area. And the reason why we did that um, is primarily because that's the range bottleneck, that's the range limit bottleneck for a lot of species. Uh, we see things like dog stringling vine, that's the current leading edge as we know it in Ontario for DSV, and uh, a few other species as well. And a lot of that information and knowledge that we kind of take for granted, the experience that we have on things like garlic mustards and buckthorns and honeysuckles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in southern Ontario, a lot of that information and expertise doesn't exist in northern Ontario or even central Ontario. Um, so what we wanted to do with this program is kind of take those lessons learned, transport them all the way up to northern and central Ontario, and hopefully stop the spread of many species. And this program has really been tailored to focus on new species, things that aren't established in an area. So um, we'll be going to southern Ontario and talking about uh, garlic mustard and fragrance through the lead of this program. Very important species, very you know, ecologically critical species to talk about, but through the lens of this program, that's just a little bit beyond the scope. And it's a partnership between organizations like OIPC that are focused on plants and others that aren't necessarily focused on plants. So we tend to dabble outside of the plant world a little bit. At and I just wanted to give you some examples of kind of workshops and initiatives and efforts that we've had that kind of define the scope. So what I'm hoping you can do here is, is Maybe you can kind of turn that light bulb in your head and say, hey, I understand how this applies to my own purple park that I'm, I'm operating or my own conservation area that, that I'm kind of the, the point person on. So hoping through some of these kind of different individual parcels, we can kind of start to turn those light switches on together. So with that in mind, um, some of the activities and kind of targeted training workshops we've had are things like CFIA summer staff inspection training. And it's very hard to talk about plants that don't exist in an area. So one of the kind of creative tools we've used to get around that are things like recreating the communities we would expect to find species X, Y, or Z. And so for instance, if we're talking about um, um, some starry thistles maybe that don't exist in Canada yet, but we want to train these summer inspection staff or even volunteers to understand what are the conditions that would cue, uh, that would kind of flip the switch when they see that species for the first time in Ontario. We basically just take a printout of a species, put an obstacle stick, and, and put it in a similar plant community or in a similar spot on a site that we expect to come across it for the first time. So some of those star thistles that I was talking about, um, they tend to be agricultural species that might be brought in on uh, near train tracks or near trailheads. And so when we're doing this kind of um, invasive plant hide-and-go-seek game, when we're planting these kind of popsicle stick printouts, um, in throughout a park or in throughout an area, we're trying to recreate the conditions that you might expect to see that. So that's a tool hopefully you utilize either in staff training or volunteer training. Um, a couple other, sorry, just in awareness of time here, I should probably get going here. Um, professional training sessions as well. On the same note, I'll, you know, in order to bring all these species together to train either volunteers or staff in one place, it can be challenging, right? If we're trying to train people on Emerald Ash Borer, and wild parsnip and phragmites at the same time. They occur in very different habitat types, very different parts of the landscape. Um, so one of the tools we've used to kind of get around that is either renting a bus or doing a carpool invasive species tour. And we found that to be a pretty good effective um, engagement technique. Um, the other tools we've used, uh, for instance, if anybody's familiar with hemlock woolly adelgid, Anybody's familiar with hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, the surveying technique you use for that is by channeling your inner Dennis the Menace, taking a racquetball and a slingshot and taking some Velcro, put Velcro around the racquetball and firing it up 10 times into the canopy of hemlock. And what you're looking for is to pick up with that Velcro on those balls, the uh, overwintering egg sacs. So we found that to be a really effective technique. We've used that with groups in Mississauga, in Oakville, in Sault Ste. Marie. Um, it tends to be a very effective engagement tool, especially for some of the uh, younger demographic, you know, high school boys and girls who can shoot the ball farther into the canopy. Boys and girls, um, it, it tends to be a great engagement tool. And it's a good opportunity for us to start the dialogue, start the conversation around that. So I'd really recommend that. There's a peer-reviewed journal that actually outlines the method. It's not as silly as it sounds. Um, feel free to contact me outside of the webinar, and I'd be happy to pass that on if that's something you think you could use. We also do lake association training through this EDRR program as well. We found that to be a really effective tool. Um, one of the more interesting techniques we've used for those lake association training workshops 
has been by having the samples of the plants on site. Um, we ask people to go back to their home um, when they're coming to our workshops, please bring a, a plastic baggie full of that quote unquote weed at the foot of your dock or at the foot of your um, shoreline. Bring that in and we'd be happy to show you how you can use an identification key to figure out what that is. So we found that to be, you know, just show slides to people in a room in a workshop for a day it tends to be a little bit tough to engage these folks in. But one of those tools we found to be really effective is to bring home a bit of local knowledge. Have them bring in their species to you and I'm sure it's within your expertise to be able to identify it or at least show them the tools to be able to identify it. Based on species summits, we want that to be another great engagement tool as well, um, basically inviting um, university and college students from across the watersheds we're working in to kind of come together understanding that these people taught to share uh, lessons learned with the lab next door that they're working on a very similar project. So bringing people together under kind of a united banner tends to help. Species Awareness Week, which we find a really um, helpful engagement tool as well. Uh, if you're interested in participating that, the 2018 version of Species Week Ontario uh, is going to be the last week of February. So if you're interested or your organization would like to participate, please let us know. Uh, we'll have invasive species cycling tours we've done for a couple years and they've been really effective. Obviously, IPC's mandate is not about safe cycling necessarily, but if we can use that as a medium, if there's volunteer groups within the community that we have yet to engage on the topic of invasive species and invasive plants, and if we can build that into kind of a regular programming, we, we've had to be a really kind of creative technique for trying to get across our message with all invasive plant identification and understanding of the impacts associated with it. Uh, we've also, we're doing a, a hemlock woolly adelgid bus tour to the states as well uh, in the fall, uh, sorry, in the winter 2018. So if that's kind of an interesting tool you think you might be able to use, maybe it's within your watershed or between your conservation authority, um, or between your conservation areas, let's say you wanted to lead a daily tour. Um, I think that's a, a really effective tool that we've had some nice success with too. So those are just kind of a handful of the projects that we've done through EDRR, and uh, I think they have different application. Hopefully they can kind of light a fire under um, something you can use. Now for the rest of the webinar here, what I was hoping to do is pitch our program to another organization. So very kindly, I've had a, um, a handful, a half a dozen organizations that have been kind enough to kind of trust me to try and relay some of their stories. Um, of really interesting, unique approaches they're using to engage their volunteer bases on invasive species. And, and the first one's a little bit different. The rest of them fit that mold nicely. But what I wanted to do is I, I'm forecasting many people on this webinar today um, are either managing their own properties and maybe they have established programs for dealing with invasive species or maybe they're just thinking about trying to get there. And for those people who may not be aware, I just wanted to pitch this one program that the Invading Species Awareness Program has. Um, ISAP, Invading Species Hit Squad. And if you're not familiar with it, it's existed for 10 years now. We're just going past their, their, their 10th year now. And essentially what their program does is in a very unified uh, way uh, for Canada summer job funding to fund summer students, train summer students so that they can identify these species. If that's not a capacity that exists within your own in-house organization, um, this is a skill set that by kind of sending summer staff to a two or three day training session, they can get those skills and hopefully be able to bring them back to your community. And so it's a partnership program. It's partially run through ISAP and there's also a local connection. So you've got summer student for 12 or 16 weeks, depending on what the funding allows. Local hosts all across the province, as I say before, the first couple of days is these students coming together in a central hub, basically going through invasive species boot camp. There's been 53 separate partners that have hosted um, Hit Squad students over the last 10 years of the program. And the number tends to be about 30 or 35 students every year. Uh, so there is a bit of a wait list and it's pretty competitive, but if that's something that would help enable you to develop an invasive species program, I really encourage you to reach out to ISAP to find out a little bit more information. Um, so since over the last 10 years, there have been uh, just shy of 260 students that have got, like been funneled through this program. And each student really, you know, their work schedule and priorities are, are 
um, predominantly set by the local host organization, so that would be your organization that would host the student for the summer. Um, and their activities tend to range. They could be more community event focused. Um, some organizations, uh, like particular conservation authorities, tend to have invasive species control be a predominant focus of the work plan of the student. Sometimes they're very much focused on monitoring or reporting, typically through the EdMaps a website and app. Sometimes they're a little more outreach focused with regards to watercraft inspection. So you can choose your own adventure based on what your organization's work plan is. Um, now let's get into the cost of this program. Um, most of the funding, the, the majority of salary dollars are funded through Canada's Summer Jobs Program, um, but it does require a bit of a, a wage top up from their host organizations, and that tends to vary based on how long you want the student for, um, what wage you want to set for them, but it tends to be somewhere between three and $500 for a full season. So if, if you're listening to this webinar today and your perspective is, it's just me fighting invasive species. I want to start a program, but I just don't have any resources outside of myself. This might be a, a bit of a stepping stool to start launching that program, being able to attend more community events, um, reach out to more volunteers, and really engage them on a more regular basis, for instance. So I just wanted to promote this as a, as a nice tool opportunity for you to perhaps explore. Um, their training basically, as I say before, they can focus on different activities depending on your work plan, education and outreach, monitoring and early detection and reporting, or it could be more control and management response oriented. The example, this is kind of what that looks like on a daily basis here, what these students are involved in. It might be leading a garlic mustard poll, it might be helping to um, pull or, or lead a community event uh, focused around water soldier or an aquatic plant. Again, the, the work plan is really driven by the local host. So I'll just throw out a couple examples of recent students that uh, what they've done. Uh, so Devin Scratch from Wheatley Provincial Park um, was uh, attending a lot of fishing derbies recently, and so the local priority that was developed. At Sybil Point Provincial Park, Nigel Moyer um, was really focused on outreach towards campers, developing their Learn to Camp program and where invasive species fit into that. At Gasca Region Conservation Authority, uh, Porsche was really focused on, on leading kind of educational and outreach events um, through invasive species trail walks and hikes. Aereo Streams, Michael Brown's focus was on garden center outreach, again, focusing on that horticultural pathway. So you really develop your own students' work plan. So with this in mind, I wanted to get into kind of the meat of the presentation in the webinar today, which was just citing some case study examples here of different partner organizations and how they've kind of developed programs. And a couple of these are, are pretty big programs um, that require a full-time staff person or close to that, a very regular engagement here. And some of these are just kind of one-off individual independent events. So I'm hoping you can take you know, different um, lessons learned from each of these independently and apply this to your own setting. So a little bit of information about Riverwood Conservancy. Uh, Riverwood Conservancy is a conservancy that stewards 150 acres of property in Mississauga. They have a range of ecological communities on Riverwood lands, and much of the property is adjacent to the Credit River in Mississauga. The site is obviously very well developed being in central Mississauga, and it's extremely well used by local residents. And because of this, they're seeing considerable pressures to the site and, and almost a constant source of new invasive plant material, new seed sources, and sources of disturbance. And so, as you might have guessed, garlic mustard has been a great example of an invasive plant pressure that Riverwoods face. They've got about five acres of the site that has very healthy, robust populations of garlic mustard. So what they've done to kind of combat this uh, challenge and situation is that they've developed the Garlic Mustard Task Force. And Derek's on the call today, and uh, he's been nice enough to provide me with some of this information. But just some of the info that I wanted to relay is that um, the program was started um, a little bit earlier than 2014, and since then they've seen year, seen kind of year over year declines in garlic mustard. So rely on seasonal staff members to engage, train, and then recruit new and existing volunteers to support the garlic mustard task force program objectives and priorities. And the program operates as a bit of a drop-in. They go four days a week, which tends to be critical to their success. They run an after-school program Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 4 p.m. till 7 p.m. during peak garlic mustard season, so very early summer. And they also run the fourth session every week on Saturdays from 9 a.m. till noon. So very regular engagement. They have these regular volunteers that come out time after time, and so new faces every time as well. 
Many of the regular um, dedicated volunteers are, are tend to be older. Um, but the thing I really wanted to highlight, the thing that I think makes uh, this program drive this program, is the life that Riverwood staff are going to here to engage um, high school students and the return on investment that they're able to generate. Because from previous experience of my own, it can be challenging to try and justify running these events when you only have a couple people showing up to these events. But they're very much seeing the polar opposite of that at Riverwood, and that's why I wanted to highlight this as a nice example. So to recruit volunteers for the Garlic Mustard Task Force program, Riverwood staff are posting flyers in local high schools. They're promoting the program uh, as an opportunity to reach community service and volunteer targets that every student must meet. And they also reach out to participants from previous years as well. And they're also really good at uh, promoting within Riverwood's kind of broader organization to other non-garlic mustard focused volunteers that Riverwood may have. And just to kind of a couple um, examples, I guess, of what this buy-in looks like from some of these volunteers, this, the high school students in particular, is that in 2017, Derek provided me um, with some information that one of their high school volunteers logged 120 hours contributing to the Garlic Mustard Task Force. This is obviously well in excess of kind of the minimum volunteer requirements. So this one particular student showed the initiative, ended up bringing out uh, multiple different um, kind of friends and colleagues who were able to log their own hours. And each of those were able to hit dozens and dozens of hours as well. So it just shows that the importance of getting that one champion to kind of uh, put the needle into a new group of contacts. Their leading high school volunteer from the program, this is over multiple years, has uh, logged more than 300 hours of garlic mustard task force volunteer time. And that's across multiple field seasons, as I said. Um, but I think that's just an incredible stat, absolutely remarkable, more than 300 hours of uh, garlic mustard uh, stewardship and polling. So Red staff, in addition to this kind of very targeted regular occurrence training, they also um, target get corporate volunteers, corporate stewardship volunteers to drive the results as well. Obviously, there's costs and benefits as anybody who's ever tried to um, herd a group of 40 volunteers or more uh, into a bit of a sensitive ecological site. There's obviously going to be challenges associated with that. Riverwood staff are finding that can be a really important tool in hitting some of those more degraded sites. Some of the areas where we don't necessarily have a, a thriving native plant community interspersed with garlic mustard, uh, that's a perfect site to kind of use those large teams. And all the, um, these kind of two groups or two approaches I said that the Garlic Mustard Task Force has used here, uh, they're coming together with some really interesting results. So in 2014, there were 2,700 pounds of fresh ate garlic mustard, 2,700 pounds. And in 20, uh, 2016, sorry, they were not to be outdone. Their actual annual uh, number for the 2016 season was a little bit more than 5,300 pounds of fresh garlic mustard weight. So really remarkable volumes of garlic mustard being removed from these sites. Uh, really, really impressive. So the numbers reflect, um, a, there's a little bit more guess, to the story as well, because obviously they're revisiting sites year over year here. They have the capacity and volunteer ability to be able to resend folks to the same sites year over year. And we're seeing some interesting decline. Now, obviously, there's always going to be a continued source being in such an urban area of new garlic mustard seed and plant material coming in. Um, but they've been able to combat this a bit, uh, going about um, uh, pulling out first year basal rosettes in some of those sites that they've revisited for a number of years. So, a really interesting engagement tool, I guess, there. We're starting to be able to show these people um, that the results of year over year efforts are taking, taking hold. If there was kind of in one sentence, what is the most interesting takeaway? How can this be incorporated into perhaps your own programming? Uh, from my outside perspective, I'm seeing the Riverwood Conservancy and their Garlic Mustard Task Force being effective because they're engaging volunteers on a regular basis. They're specifically targeting what are the bar asking themselves what are the barriers that are preventing folks from coming out on a very regular basis to become engaged, to become those weekly or, or daily members of the Garlic Mustard Task Force. Um, and by having regular events, they're basically removing every excuse. You know, everyone's very busy. Volunteer time is at a premium here. And by holding events uh, four times a week, three out of the five weeknights plus one weekend event, they're, they're doing a great job at removing any barrier that could potentially get in the way. To give you an idea, this is what it looks like here. So again, really impressive results, widely dispersed across a property. There's no reason why this model couldn't be located and become really useful for a wider group of folks.
And it's a little bit outside the scope of this program, but as I said before, it's kind of a two-pronged approach in invasive plant control. And so very quickly, I think this is just such an interesting, unique program that I wanted to pitch it a little bit and just kind of, again, give folks an idea. If we're thinking about invasive plant restoration, bigger picture, and very holistically, I think this is an engagement tool that maybe could be more widely adapted. This is their native plant propagation program, or known affectionately as NP3. Uh, the partnership between the Conservancy, between Riverwood Conservancy and their local conservation authority, which is Credit Valley Conservation. And the program is Riverwood uh, staff supported but volunteer led. So these volunteers really have very critical roles. There's kind of three primary roles that these volunteers would focus in on. And it's the message I'm getting from Riverwood staff is that it's really the, the critical piece here is about understanding who are those kind of core folks to engage, who are those local champions that have the expertise that can enable a program like this to thrive, and what I do or what can we do as staff or, or kind of broader coordinators to enable those people to take the reins with a program like this. So there's three different roles you could be um, if you're participating in native plant in, in an MP3 program. You'd be a seed forecaster. Obviously, that's a very limited skill set that might be a little bit more challenging. Um, there are seed forecasting courses and seed collection courses available. Um, uh, I'm thinking of the um, uh, Forest Ontario version of the of the course, and that can be a useful skill set. And and so you need kind of a front of line person who's monitoring these plant uh, plant programs or populations throughout the summer. And they would again give the directive over to seed collectors who are able to go out to different sites, both on this property and off this property, with permission and kind of doing it in an ecologically responsible fashion, of course with land permission as well, to collect sufficient volumes of seed to enable the last role, which are these uh, plant foster parents, to be able to use and plant in these uh, plants. I think one of the interesting takeaways here um, is that you kind of builds in this stewardship by definition idea um, to their volunteers that are participating in NP3. So it really depends on the quality of commitment and you being able to identify those core volunteers it really depends on what your scope of your expectations are as well, making sure that this is not necessarily going to provide a solution to us revegetating or, or restoring an entire um, site, but it might be a helpful tool in years where grant resources may be a little bit thin. Perhaps we didn't get that TD Friends of the Environment grant, um, or perhaps we missed out on another grant or two or want to divert funding elsewhere. This kind of provides you with a bit of a baseline plant, um, plant stock that you could use to restore an area. So get partners and parcels together uh, really nicely with our garlic mustard task force program to provide a good model I think we can all collectively learn a bit from. The last uh, note that they wanted me to pass on is that species selection is really important as well. Obviously, we want these volunteers to have a good experience here, and we don't want a flat full of duds. So using your species is an important first step. So species they're recommending are asters, things like big leaf aster, New England aster, species of goldenrods, even jack in the pulpit, they tend to be really hardy species, things that we'll get good results on. I quickly wanted to go over was at Royal Botanical Gardens in Burlington, and they have a really interesting invasive shrub collaboration program that they're running that I think could serve as a nice model. It's supported by climate change, uh, sorry, Environment and Climate Change Canada's HSP or Habitat Stewardship Program, which I mentioned in an earlier slide. And it's been supported for multiple field season. And really where this fits in big picture is this is kind of a parceled out component that fits into RB's staff existing natural lands uh, programs. Now, I was a little bit surprised, but I didn't realize uh, RBG was such a massive land landholder. Actually steward and own 900 hectares of lands uh, that are classified as natural lands. So just a massive, massive scale. So this program kind of fits into their priority focus areas. And really what they saw was an opportunity based on some species at risk habitat that they had on site. So they had some Acadian flycatcher reports, which fit in really nicely to this uh, granting opportunity. And they had a, a whole laundry list of invasive shrubs, which I'll go through in a second here, that were negatively impacting that. So they saw that being a great link to this kind of um, new previously untapped funding source in the guard. So what does this program look like on the ground and what can we learn out of this? Um, their ongoing stewardship, this really fits into kind of a, a very seasonal regard to that. So they have a fall stewardship program with regards to this invasive shrub control. Um, it's often style event 
it's a weekend event, um, basically for six weeks consecutive. And what they're doing is having one staff go out and kind of, you know, educate, train, and, and basically enable their volunteer crew. They're using kind of a very, a very typical um, communication techniques to kind of drive uh, volunteerism into this program. So using things like emails, social media engagement, posters at local uh, public spaces as well. And they're finding a good return on investment for that. So we've seen approximately half a dozen events held, being held every year. Again, they're going after buckthorn, common privet, multi-flora rose, different barberries, honeysuckles as well, other invasive shrubs. Most of the species that I'm sure many people on the webinar are engaged with already. And these events tend to be physically control focused. So we're talking about equipment uh, that they already have on hand in many cases, things like extractigators, hats, shovels, and other tools that are pretty common. We're seeing a really good return on investment from, from staff being reported through this program here. It's relatively inexpensive outside of staff time to operate this kind of a thing and outside of equipment maintenance as well. And they're able to find new groups of volunteers through using this kind of a control technique and uh, kind of program structure as well. The takeaways I wanted to mention, um, there's actually two, two. Uh, but, but I guess the one that's priority right now is that we have a lot of discussion around invasive plant disposal across the province right now, and many of you folks are engaged with this right now. Um, we should all be lucky to have a bunch of invasive plant material to be removed by volunteers, but what do we do with it? And one thing that RBG and Credit Valley Conservation Authority is also using this technique as well. Um, and I, I just wanted to get this point across is that invasive shrub removal on non-high visibility sites, so if we're off in the, off in the middle of a woodlot, for instance, um, many groups are now starting to basically just take out the root ball um, and just roots up exposed in trees. So it eliminates a lot of the issues around disposal. Obviously, that's not going to be appropriate for a very small, high visibility woodlot in the center of an urban area. But if this is within the scope of your program and you're finding it to be a bit of a bottleneck for you and your staff time and volunteer time on what do we do with all this plant material we've just removed, I do encourage everybody to at least consider that, that this is a good, I guess, idea and opportunity for getting rid of large volumes of invasive plant material like buckthorn and barberry. This is a one-off opportunity. The programs I've talked about before are really programs, but this is kind of more of a one-off event. And this is being run out of the Hazelbird Nature Reserve in Baltimore, Ontario. And it's being run by staff from the local Nature Conservancy of Canada office. And the seasonality of the species in the holidays, I just couldn't resist mentioning this. So Nature Conservancy of Canada manage a number of tall grass prairies in Ontario. And one of the sites that their staff have investigated, uh, or, or I guess invested, sorry, a great amounts of resources and effort is over at Hazelbird Nature Reserve, a uh, tall grass prairie site. And if there's any prairie managers listening in, I hope that you'd agree with me that invasive plant establishment is the bigger challenges of prairie restoration and ongoing prairie management. The common invasive plants that we tend to focus in on when we're talking about prairie management and prairie restoration in Ontario uh, tends to be Scott's pine. And Scott's pine has a really interesting, kind of unique, detailed history of restoration in Ontario and in our kind of soil conservation landscape. Uh, but of more relevance right now, I guess the main point I wanted to drive home was that this was used as a Christmas tree for plantations for quite a while. And in, as a true example, I guess, of making lemonade out of lemons, uh, NCC staff have organized a number of events encouraging participants to channel their inner Clark Griswold and join them for a few hours of stewardship as they come choose their own invasive Christmas tree to take home if they wish. It's an inexpensive run, uh, event to run. It requires only hand tools, a little bit of staff time to coordinate, and provides a nice opportunity to engage a, a new potential group of volunteers um, who may not have been interested in coming out to previous stewardship events. Now, for another level fun, of fun um, with support from uh, groups like TD Friends of the Environment Foundation, I've been able to host uh, Make Your Own Wreath events in the past. Volunteers are encouraged to weave in their invasive plant stewardship trimmings uh, into wreaths that they can then take home. And so I realize that many of you folks on the call might not be engaging volunteers around Scott's Pine stewardship on a regular basis per se, um, but I think in the spirit of the season and in the spirit of good and creative stewardship, I think it's a good opportunity for us to kind of think about how this sort of an activity um, could be converted into an activity that's happening on your own properties. So with this in mind, um, 
would us turn this over to you and, and provide with our last 10 minutes a bit of an open forum just to discuss what's working for us collectively, what's not working for us. Are there any kind of interesting, unique events that you'd be comfortable sharing through this lens uh, that we could then kind of circulate throughout this group and just kind of spark some new ideas within our group to keep our content and programming fresh? So if you don't mind, I'd uh, certainly welcome you in the chat box just on your right side, up right hand side of your screen. Um, if you can go ahead and type in your name if you're interested, if you've got something interesting to say. I see Allison's chimed in. So with me for a second here, Allison, I'm going to try and find a way to unmute you if you could give me one second. We've experiences with this in the past here, so let's do. And I'm going to unmute you here. I okay, think we can hear you. Allison, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Oh. Do you hear me? And there, Allison. Okay. Are you me okay, now? Allison, do you just uh, say hello to us? Hello. Can you guys hear me? And on the fly, this is what we get for trying something new. Stephanie Parrish said she can hear me. I see Allison saying that she other people can hear her. Let me. Are you there? I, sorry, it was such an amateur thing. I had my volume on mute. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Go right ahead, Allison. So I'm calling from Downsview um, in Toronto, and we I run the education program here, and we've been uh, working with uh, lots of garlic mustard, and we found making garlic mustard pesto has been a really big hit. So um, last summer, we introduced uh, an edible program. So it's about foraging, and we do part um, invasive species collection, and we also do like a fun activity like, like garlic mustard, mustard pe um, pestos. We do other activities where they can repurpose whatever invasive we're working on at the time, and doing as well as doing a harvesting in our garden, things like that. So it's more just um, the, you know having them just come and pull, but that's part of the program as well. And it's been, uh, Pretty successful, I think. Great idea. Do you have a, a particular recipe that you, or a source, I guess, maybe that you could share with some folks? Might um, be interesting. I will. I, I can uh, look. At, if you just look up, there's like tons of different ideas. Really, all oil, a little Parmesan cheese, you know, a little salt and pepper, and uh, the garlic mustard washed in in a blender. Awesome. Pretty delicious. So Japanese knotweed fruit roll-ups. I don't know if we've given that a shot. But there's a good website I, I came across recently called Invasive Boar. Like, like yeah. And uh, they've got all kinds of neat recipes. So I, I don't know. That, that sounds like a great idea. That's a really good idea. So hopefully people can take some of those ideas. Um, so I've got, uh, let's see here if I can get somebody else into the conversation. Uh, anybody else on the call here that have an interesting take here that they'd like to? Oh, Iola. Iola just sent me a message here, and she says that I have uh, a cookies and cookie night in the fall, and about 50 people coming in um, sharing their own experiences, I guess. So so that would kind of be, Iola, that would be independent property management, or are those uh, folks here engaging from throughout your own community? A good opportunity just to have people kind of coming together and discussing it collectively. Um, okay, Mike, I just saw you there chime in, so just give me one sec. I'm going to try and bring you in here. Give me a second here. Mike, here you are. Are you on? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Uh, so I'm with the city of Toronto. 
Romano, Urban Forestry. Uh, we do a lot of volunteer engagement within the city of Toronto. Uh, my question is about uh, disposal. So the idea of hanging stuff in trees is not uh, achievable in city of Toronto Park. So we're and we're always worried that it's going to encourage other people to dump their waste and that kind of stuff. We do a lot of different species management. One of the different is uh, fragmenting. I'll let, I got something to contribute, but maybe if somebody else has a good um, answer, if they can time, chime in on the chat function as well. Just on the disposal note, so the OIPC, and thanks to everybody who's a member here because that was, and the city of Toronto absolutely is, um, because we took a few membership dollars this year and went to Trent University and asked a grad student there if they could help us out basically answering the question, what happens with all this invasive plant material that's going into the yard waste stream? And are those kind of municipal compost facilities, are they getting hot enough to kill things like like Greg Mighty Seed or even Garlic Mustard Seed or DSV Seed? And a number of other groups have, have come together with uh, small amounts of money as well to help grow the program. So MNRF and York Region as well, and, and a couple other groups. And um, so hopefully we'll have some good results I don't know if that's going to help you in particular in this regard, but um, the one other thing that comes to mind that might be a little bit more helpful for you is uh, the group Georgian Bay Forever. They've got a really nice FRAG, very um, volunteer-oriented control program. And I don't know if this is very helpful in your regards, but they do a lot of burning on it. So they'll bring it into kind of like a gravel pit um, or an agricultural setting that will enable that to be done. And, and so that's one way they've gotten rid of an awful lot of biomass. but and probably doing that in the city of Toronto Park is the greatest idea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so please don't say that the OIPC condoned that. <laughs> I just got a note here from Iowa as well. Oh, no microphone. A, kind of a volunteer group that's coming together for, for cookies, coffee, and invasive plant chatting. Um, a network with the Nature Conservancy as well. Nice. Uh, so we have a question there from Hannah. Uh, Hannah asks, how does EDRR compare to iNaturalist? It can be difficult to ask people to submit their wild sightings to multiple different citizen science projects. Absolutely, that's a great point. So we have so our ED our, our early detection rapid response program yeah, that's very much about citizen science engagement and using tools that exist. Um, we're often it's a C acronym. We're often confused with EDMAPS E D D M A P S, and that is a, a, a smartphone app and a website that people can submit um, questions to or sorry reportings to. Each has essentially what is like a Wikipedia page as well. They're more or less similar features. iNaturalist obviously is all taxa inclusive. Edmas is not. The the main point I'd like to point out that um, in my best opinion tilts the favor towards Edmaps is that all of those reports that are coming into Edmaps are then verified by somebody on the other end. Whereas to my understanding, and that could be incorrect, but my understanding of iNaturalist is that that doesn't happen. There's no kind of back checking with iNaturalist. But if we were to say submit a report of giant hogweed, and it was actually wild parsnip, say on the other end of EdMaps, there's actually an Ontario-based staff person who's able to look at those pictures that you've submitted and say, uh, basically respond back to you saying, thank you for coming out, but you know there was a misidentification here. Here's a useful resource that would help you in your identification moving forward. That's, you can check that out at edmaps.org slash Ontario. And I'll just kind of, it's an interesting, timely point. Um, if anybody's interested in where's the closest patch of species X, Y, or Z to me, there's a perfect um, opportunity for you to check that out. They have real-time maps of reports of invasive species across Ontario, plants and other species. So if you want to, say, lead a tour to a giant hogweed site, if you're silly enough to do that, that would be a great resource. So it's edmaps.org slash Ontario. Great question um, from a garden center. 
and basically making the point that they've taken the initiative um, and, and kudos to them for stopping to sell invasive plant primer, uh, priority of some plant species and getting a comprehensive list is a bit challenging. Um, and and so on how it's customer to avoid invasive species. So I agree that's a great point. We hear that frequently that there's no kind of single unified comprehensive list. The best resource I just wanted to, to point you towards is that there's a gentleman who's been hired by NRF in the past named Stephen Smith. And if you Google UFORA, Euphora, it's Urban Forests and Associates, um, he's got a really nice list on his website that has served as kind of a default comprehensive list across Ontario. So it's a really interesting. So if you Google UFORA, Ontario Invasive Species, I suspect you'll be able to find it quite easily. But that's a nice kind of single one-stop shop for all invasive plant species, um, or any of the vast majority of them in Ontario. And any advice on how to convince customers to avoid invasive plants? Well, um, we have a great program. It's called the Grow Me Instead program on our website. And we have these nice pamphlets. Um, hopefully you've come across them before. And what they do is uh, imagine a fold-out pamphlet. There's four parcels, four kind of subsections to this guide we're looking at. And one of them would be a uh, invasive plant material that's commonly available, and that would be in a red background. And anything that's in a green background on the same page or an adjacent page would have similar light requirements, similar soil types, moisture regimes, machines that sort of thing, and they're native species, so that the, we're promoting the use of native plant alternatives. Um, but just thank you for bringing up that point. That's, a, that's an excellent point. So we have one recommendation here based on um, disposal and, and thinking about disposal sites. Uh, they're saying that they've worked with their local municipality to designate a particular disposal site for invasives, and we have volunteers monitoring it until we can find a better resolution. I think that's a great action. We've seen that be used by some conservation authorities as well on a local level, like a site level. So for instance, Ganaraska, uh, when they're doing garlic mustard uh, initiatives on a site, they have like a garlic mustard compost heap on site. So they're realizing that it's just beyond the feasibility of that program to remove all of that plant material, send it to the landfill, for instance. So what they're doing instead is basically just creating a chicken wire pen and on site maintaining all that plant material on site and having it compost out there. Similar to what you guys are doing, that's, that's a great idea, a great way to deal with that. Oh, there's a great clarification there on iNaturalist um, saying that they do indeed uh, try to help confirm ID submissions. That's a great point of clarification. Thanks for making that. Um, and then the last question, this is a good note to leave off on, is somebody asking, do we have Grow Me Instead guides in stock? I'm very sorry if we haven't been able to fill an order of those in the past few. We've been out of them for a while. But as of a couple days ago, we have a bunch in stock. Um, and they're all available for free, of course, as well. We try and ask groups to cover the shipping by donation if that's possible. Uh, if not, we'd be happy to try and find a worker in there. If you want to shoot me an email, if you'd like to request some garlic mustard, all right, some Grow Me Instead guides. Uh, we have both Southern and Northern Ontario in stock now. We have a resource form available on our website too, which might be easier if you go to ontarioinvasiveplants.ca. There's a resource request form there, and it's just easier to keep track of name and mailing address. And you can click off how many of resource wires that you'd like, and we'd be very pleased to ship them to you. So I think the perfect uh, note to leave off on, thanks so much for everybody who attended today. Um, I know it's a bit of a different topic we haven't covered in a past webinar, but I love that we were able to kind of discuss it in a more open format towards the end there. Again, a quick plug that we have after the holidays there, we have our, our series continuing, meaning six webinars are going to be held, uh, very different topic topics every week. We're certainly looking forward to uh, the generous volunteer experts that have volunteered to uh, to lead those webinars in, uh, on their own. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, please feel free to shoot me or Kelly Sherman an email. Um, we'd be happy to answer any questions related to resources or today's webinar. I should have today's webinar posted within a day or two on our website. And with that in mind, thank you very much for tuning in. Happy holidays, and we'll talk to you in the new year. Take care, everybody.